Hello everyone, welcome to this session of AD Update 2024. First of all, thank you for logging in. Wishing you a very happy new year. And what's better to celebrate this new year with learning what are the updates, how to treat your patients to know about the ADA 2024. I am Dr. Mayur Agrawal, DMDNB Endocrine from Bhopal, founder and director of Hormone India faculty for Marrow Super Specialty Endocrinology. So let's start session of ADA 2024. I'll be telling you mostly about the 2024 guideline, but I'll also briefly tell you about what has changed from 21 to 22, from 22 to 23 and from 23 to 24. Practically, it is not possible to tell you everything. The guidelines are close to 300 pages. So I'll be briefly discussing on the important aspects, what you should be knowing before treating your patient. That is what I'll be focusing on this year in 24 ADA this guidelines were divided into 17 sessions so firstly the title that was changed from for the section 2 from diagnosis and classification this was the newer one earlier it was classification and diagnosis of diabetes now it is diagnosis and classification of diabetes the cutoffs are same and they have included one recommendation that is in the absence of unequivocal hyperglycemia diagnosis requires a confirmatory testing so that is what we used to do previously also right the cutoffs are same fasting is more than 126 2 hour plasma glucose more than 200 hb1c more than 6.5 and for fasting you need 8 hours of fasting and this is 2 hours after the 75 gram of anhydrous glucose so all those remain same what has changed is that HbA1c was put lower down in the previous guideline here it becomes in the topmost okay so HbA1c more than 6.5 fasting more than 126 and 2 hour plasma glucose more than 200 and symptoms of hyperglycemia so all those are cut uh, guidelines for diagnosis almost the same thing now this flow chart this algorithm has been included in the recent 2024 guidelines that were not in 23 you see here Maybe it's not much visible for you. Adults with suspected type 1, you have to test for autoantibodies. So that is what we were doing, right? Now, what antibody? So basically, the guideline says that first, you should be testing for GAD antibody because that's the most prevalent, right? So that is what you will be testing first. And if that is negative, you have to go for IA2 or ZN T8. So this is what we used to do, but now this is incorporated in a flowchart also. Okay. Now, if this any of this is positive that means the kid or the the patient now we have we have adults also childs also so right so this is type 1 diabetes if the antibodies are positive but even with type 1 also 5 to 10 percent of your patient may have antibodies negative right because for every test you know there is a sensitivity and a specificity so even if the antibodies are there your test may not detect right and then there are something patients with type 1 who will not have antibodies right so these are the things you should be knowing so if the antibodies are negative and if the adult your whatever your patient is less than 35 years then if this patient have features of monogenic diabetes then probably you are dealing with that if that is there then you have to measure c peptide if it is less than 200 picomole probably you are dealing with type 1 and if it is more than 200 then you have to test for modi okay and if the patient do not have feature of monogenic diabetes then if the patient do not have any features of type 2 diabetes probably you are dealing with a type 1 adult patient now if the age is more than 35 and autoantibodies are negative and you don't have much features of other thing then you have to measure a c peptide after three years of the diabetes and if that is less than 200 then probably you are dealing with type 1 if this is more than 600 probably you are dealing with type 2 so more than 600 picomole of c peptide that is more than 1.8 nanogram per ml that defines that probably you are dealing with a type 2 diabetes okay so these guidelines this algorithm was incorporated in 2024 
now let's see how do you see for features of this MODI monogenic diabetes okay so for monogenic diabetes at the diagnosis the hb1c is less than 75 7.5 one parent is with diabetes and then you have some features like renal cyst partial lipodystrophy midd that is maternally inherited diabetes with deafness and severe insulin resistance in absence of obesity and then something for you have a prediction model probability so this is from extra so if that is more than five percent probably you are dealing with monogenic diabetes so there is a modi calculator you can get from this side this is obviously free of charge so they have some eight component here you have to put age of diagnosis of the diabetes and the current age the sex of the patient whether the patient is treated with insulin or oha and if on insulin then when the insulin was started like within six months of diagnosis or more than that and then the bmi and present hb1c and when whether the patient's parent have diabetes or not so when you will fill all this data the app will give you a probability and if that is more than five percent probably you are dealing with monogenic diabetes okay so this was updated in 2024 now in 2024 they have also updated regarding the delay of this type 1 diabetes so you know depending on the age of the patient depending on what antibodies and how many antibodies the patient have the probability of that patient developing the diabetes type 1 diabetes changes right so that is what has been updated in 2024 having multiple confirmed islet autoantibodies is a risk factor for clinical diabetes testing for dysglycemia may be used to further forecast near term risk when multiple islet autoantibodies are identified, referral to a specialized center for further evaluation and consideration of a clinical trial or approved therapy to potentially delay the development of clinical diabetes should be considered. So this is about your teplizumab that has recently been approved. So that was included in this year guideline. We'll be talking more about that. So this was recently updated in 2024. Now after this COVID pandemic, too many things have been written about the COVID in the guideline. I'm briefly telling about that. So COVID-19 pandemic, the cases of hyperglycemia, DK and new onset diabetes have increased suggesting that this virus can unmask type 1 diabetes. So what are the probable mechanism? Virus triggered beta cell death, immune mediated loss of pancreatic beta cell, damage to the beta cell because of damage or infection to the surrounding exocrine cell and cytokine storm. So these are probable mechanism that is why the patient are developing diabetes and still far more we have to learn about that to better understand the pathogenesis there is a global registry with the name of COVID-DAB. Okay, this is about 2024. Now, for the screening of diabetes or pre-diabetes, obviously we get OGTT. In 2022, they have added this that adequate carbohydrate intake, at least 150 grams per day, should be taken three days prior to your OGTT testing. Because some patients who are taking a non a very low carb diet, their OGTT may be falsely high. So this was included in 2022. This was not there in 21. So fasting and carbohydrate restriction can falsely elevate your OGTT, and your diagnosis will be wrong. Then also in 22. They have updated that screening for pre-diabetes and diabetes should begin at 35 years. So in 21 guideline, it was 45 years. In 22 guidelines, it was 35 and they have made it same till now 24 also. It is 35 years only. So the screening should begin at 35 years in these. These are the guidelines in whom you should screen. So criteria for screening for diabetes and pre-diabetes in asymptomatic obviously screening is for asymptomatic only if symptomatic that is not a screening okay that's diagnosis so screening criteria for asymptomatic adults so testing should be done in obese for indians we'll calculate as 23 as bmi if the first degree relative we have with diabetes high risk ethnicity that is indians history of cvd hypertension now you see here this is about ada 23 here 
the hypertension was mentioned as more than 140 by 90. But in 24 guideline, they have recently changed it. They have made this cutoff slightly lower. And then HDL and all those dyslipidemia, polycystic, physical inactivity and some insulin resistance signs, all those remains the same in the recent guideline also. So these are the patient, if they have one or more of the following risk factor, they should be screened with obesity. Now, patient with pre-diabetes should be tested yearly, that remains the same. Then diagnosed with GDM, you should screen lifetime every three years. Patient should be screened beyond 35 years and then if that is normal, a 3 years is good enough. You have to repeat after 3 years. People with HIV, they should be screened for your pre-diabetes and diabetes. In ADA 24, they have slightly changed this cutoff of hypertension to more than 130 by 80. Rest remains the same. All those things I am not repeating. Rest, everything is same for 23 and 24. Now, ADA, these see some guidelines, some of the slides I have put for routine information, like they are same guidelines from many years. So, I'm not telling them in which year what has been changed because it would be really confusing for every one of us. Now, see here, ADA guidelines that suggest that if your OGTT is normal, you can repeat this screening after minimal three years. It's not that yearly you should ask your patient to get the OGTT or you should not yearly screen for diabetes that is what the guideline says but sooner if there are symptoms or change in the risk factors like weight gain okay now to screen for pre-diabetes or diabetes the same thing OGTT you have to do and HBNC that everybody of us know now in 2023 there was very important change about the testing method of your HbA1c by POC machine, point of care machine. In 22, they have clearly mentioned point of care assay have not been used, they should not be used for your diagnosis. Okay. Now in 23, they have changed it that point of care HbA1c testing for diabetes is screening and diagnosis. And diagnosis is very important. Previously, it was for only your monitoring that that was approved but not for screening and diagnosis okay so screening diagnosis in 23 they have approved but for the it should be restricted to device which are approved by us fda okay so this was updated in 23 and that remains same in 24 as well now in 22 they have also changed that before 15th week of gestation test individual with risk factor and consider testing for all so this considered testing for all that was included in 22 guideline that was not there in 21 guideline so now that means at first prenatal visit of any pregnant female you should be getting an ogtt initially it was for high risk okay now it is for consider testing for all individuals so that is same in 20 22 23 24 okay so this is very important that you should get an ogtt now in 24 they have also added recently about the antipsychotic medication so this is completely changed they have included this here and they should be screened for pre-diabetes and diabetes at baseline and very important this should be repeated in 3 to 4 months 12 to 16 weeks and if that is normal then annually for those patients who are on antipsychotic medication so these are the patients whom you should be testing whom you should be screening for diabetes so this was an update in 24 the exact this all this uh, cutoffs of uh, how how much time you have to repeat all those they were not mentioned in previous year guidelines so this is a newer update of 24 now in 24 they have also mentioned that people who have pancreatitis you have to screen them for diabetes within three to six months and after that annually if that is normal okay so this was a recent update in 24 this was not mentioned in your previous year that you have to screen what was the frequency that was not mentioned obviously screening was recommended but the frequency was not there so that is a recent update in your 2024 ada now section 3 prevention or delay of diabetes and associated comorbidities so here they have removed the word type 2 because now we can delay type 1 diabetes and that is included in this section okay so in 22 
they have written the update in 22 ADA monitor for development of type 2 diabetes in those patients who have pre-diabetes at least annually and then in 21 it was written annually that you have to screen in 22 they have added this line that modify based on individual risk and benefit assessment so you can even screen it even earlier more than once a year that is what has been changed in 22 and this remains same for next three four years in the recent also it's same okay in 24 they have changed this preclinical type 1 in these type of patient you have to monitor using A1C approximately every six months and OGTT annually. Okay, so this has been changed. Those patients who have auto antibodies positive but who are not still clinically type 1, them in them you have to screen this. So this was changed in 2024. Modify frequency of monitoring based on individual risk assessment. All those things are same. And then I've already told you age, number, type of autoantibodies, all these influence that what is the time your patient is going to convert into a type 1, right? So, all these things also are important, but you should monitor them at least every 6 months you have to get your HBNC in this type of patient and you should get an OGTT at least yearly. So, this is a recent update in 24. The previous year this there was nothing mention of type 1 only type 2 was there so this year everything of type 1 has been included in this section now see here in individual at risk of development of clinical type 1 more rapid progression to clinical type 1 diabetes with younger age of zero conversion total number of autoantibodies and ia2 antibodies so these are the patient who will have more of clinical type 1, their conversion would be faster. And then something about CGM also has been mentioned. CGM can predict the progression to over diabetes or for this type 1 I am talking about with autoantibodies. OGTT testing based metrics are superior in predicting the progression compared to your CGM. But yes, CGM can predict this. So, there was a mention about the CGM also and about your type 1 diabetes. Everything has been mentioned. Now, these guidelines remain same, the ADA. So, with overweight, obesity, high risk of type 2, you should have weight loss and then you should have attention for your cardiovascular risk. Pharmacotherapy for weight management, for minimizing progression to hyperglycemia, cardiovascular risk reduction, that should be considered, okay. Then more intensive approach should be done in those patients who, who are having your BMI more than 35 and their fasting sugars are between 110 to 125, 126 obviously now they are diabetic. This is about whom you should have more aggressive uh, to prevent the progression to diabetes for type 2 I am talking about here. Okay. So, those at the higher end of your pre-diabetes, in them you should go more aggressive. That's the basic logic. Okay. Then 2 hours plasma glucose 173 to 199 and your HbA1c more than 6% with BMI of more than 35. Okay. So, this, this is same from the previous year. Now, what has been recently updated is about this taplizumab. Okay, you must have uh, read about your T-Shields, that's the name, brand name. So, this Teplizumab. So, this delay the onset of symptomatic type 1 diabetes and this should be considered in those type 1 patients who are at stage 2 with more than 8 years of age. So, this was recently approved by the FDA. This is the paper, you can read. This was published in NEGM. 2019 anti-CD3 antibody teplizumab okay so that is now recently approved this was a phase 2 randomized placebo control double blinded trial where 76 participa uh, participants were there 44 were on teplizumab whereas 32 were on placebo from 2011 to 2018 this was study was carried out and only those patients who have at least two autoantibodies positive they were included and most of them have actually three autoantibodies positive the mean duration of uh, developing type 1 diabetes was 48 months in teplizumab whereas it was lower in your 
placebo that means you are this drug delays your onset of type 1 okay the risk reduction was almost 60 percent that is important and then the presence of hla dr4 absence of hla dr3 and absence of zn t8 these patients responded better to teplizumab and you can see here that there was a drastic fall in the rate of conversion right so here you can see even within six months the graphs separated out right then in 22 obviously we know that metformin is approved here for pre-diabetes but in 22 ada they've also mentioned that you may use this in those patients who have bmi more than 35 fasting more than 110 and your hbnc more than six percent so these type of patient having pre-diabetes they may get benefit from the metformin therapy and this should be considered so this was an ada 22 update this has been retained till now then in 24 they mentioned statin therapy may increase the risk of diabetes for type 2 diabetes in such individual glucose monitoring should be done and it is not recommended that statin should be discontinued because the risk benefit ratio right so this should not be discontinued but we know that it increases the chances of diabetes in 23 this was an update regarding pioglitazone so those patients who have stroke and evidence of insulin resistance and pre-diabetes pioglitazone may be considered to lower the risk of stroke and mi okay so this was from the iris trial insulin resistance intervention after stroke trial so this was written in 2023 uh, now this has been retained so you can use pioglitazone in these type of patients now coming to section 4 comprehensive medical evaluation and assessment of comorbidities we'll be mainly talking about the vaccination bone health and nfld so in vaccination very important covid 19 this was updated in 23 and was retained in 24 i'm not going into details because it's a topic in itself then hep b influenza all those are recommended pneumonia all those things are same that remains the same ppsv 23 you have to give all your diabetic patients right so that remains the same we are not going into details again because this was updated in last year if anybody wants can go back to the last year guideline we have we did a video on that too what has been updated in the recent guideline is about the rsv vaccine so this is included in your ada 24 this was not there in ada 23 and zoster that was there in the guideline last year also but important thing in india this vaccine is available this year so zoster vaccination is something which you should prescribe to your type 2 diabetic patient in india it is approved actually about 50 years only okay so that is where you should be giving them this vaccine now in ada guidelines this was this remains the same that for type 1 diabetes you should screen for autoimmune thyroid disease and then you should also screen for the celiac if the patient have symptoms should be screened for celiac in the presence of symptoms okay so this remains the same now coming to the bone health so this was a section completely updated in 24 there was nothing mentioned much of this bone in 23 ada so you should obviously screen for uh, these patients both for type 1 as well as type 2 so fracture risk should be assessed in older adults by older adults we mean patients who are more than 65 years of age okay for them you should uh, screen for fracture risk older adults with diabetes and this should be routinely done this should be done with obviously bmd dexa scan and in younger individual with multiple risk factors you have to do it so you have to screen this patient for osteoporosis not only that you should be cautious while giving them therapy and you should know the adverse impact on the bone health whatever you're giving especially i'm talking about pioglitazone and then you should also assess about hypoglycemia so to reduce the risk of falls and fracture glycemic management the goal should be individualized and you should prioritize use of glucose lowering medication that are associated with low risk of hypoglycemia to avoid falls and then calcium and vitamin d you should have a 
RDA, whatever is recommended, right? Then anti-resorptive medication and osteoanabolic agent should be considered for patient with diabetes with a T score of less than 2.0, worse than minus 2.0. For them, you should consider treating for osteoporosis. Okay. Now, what are the risk factors? We have talked about younger patient with multiple risk factors. You have to screen, right? So, those patients who have prior osteoporotic fracture, age more than 65 years, low BMI, malabsorption, recurrent falls, use of glucocorticoid, family history, alcohol, tobacco, and rheumatoid arthritis. Regarding diabetes, the T score of worse than minus 2, frequent hypoglycemic uh, episodes, then diabetes duration more than 10 years, diabetic medication, insulin. Insulin is again important because of the increased risk of hypoglycemia. Then pyoglitazone, sulfonylureas, again because of hypoglycemia. Then HB1C more than 8%, peripheral and autonomic neuropathy, retinopathy and nephropathy. So those who are having microvascular complication, obviously you should screen them for osteoporosis. It is estimated that 20% of the individual do not survive one year after hip fracture and 60% of them do not regain their prior functionality. Hip fracture in people with diabetes is associated with greater mortality and the fracture risk with type 1 for the hip fracture it is 4.3 times and for type 2 it is 1.79 times versus your non-diabetic. And then for limb fracture also 1.8 times for the type 1 diabetes and for ankle fracture 1.9. So that means the risk of fracture increases in both type 1 as well as type 2. The meta-analysis has revealed that an 8% increase in fracture risk per 1% rise in HbA1c. So this is important. With worsening of the glycemia, the risk of fracture increases and then hypoglycemia also increases the risk by 1.5 almost 50 percent right then longer duration also increases the risk especially for type 2 diabetes more than 10 years and type 1 diabetes more than 26 years dexa scan should be performed at least five years after the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes and these patients have 5 to 10 percent higher BMD than the people without diabetes and that is why you have kept your T score slightly lower for osteoporosis what cutoff you take is minus 2.5 here in diabetic you are taking as minus 2 the reason is simple that your BMD is falsely higher right the fracture risk is higher your BMD is but not that bad right then the T score adjustment of minus 0.5 has been proposed only for this reason and then the EASO, European Association for Study of Obesity, they said that after this bariatric surgery, every two years, the patient should undergo the DEXA scan. Then, because the hip fracture risk of type 1 is starts to increase after the 50 years, you have to get the BMD after the fifth decade in type 1 diabetes, whereas your SPED do not say much about this. So, regular assessment of the Bone densitometry in youth with type 1 is still controversial and not recommended but may be considered in those patients who have celiac disease because of the malabsorption. Okay, so that is about spade. This is about your ADA 24. Then with pyoglitazone, with thiazolindiones, there is increased risk of fractures and this is almost, you can see the hazard ratio is 2.23. Okay, so that's very high with almost 300% more than that of the patient not using thiazolindione and this decreases once the patient stops using so that is from your accord study so who have discontinued thiazolindione use for one to two years the decrease is close to 50 percent right and those who have uh, discontinued use for more than two years it is almost 60 percent okay that is reduced against those patients who are using your pyoglitazone then there was some controversy regarding the canaglyphosine for the fracture that was also mentioned in this year ADA. So, CANVAS study, there was significant increase in the fracture risk by almost 50%, right? And Credence study, it showed that there is no risk, increased risk of fracture. Insulin, 
the risk is there for the uh, fractures and the probable reason is because of hypoglycemia because of the longer duration of the disease where you put the these patients on insulin and then because of the all the microvascular macrovascular complication they already have so that's the reason that the insulin usage has been associated with increased risk of fractures now in ada guideline about the testo also it was mentioned this is again previously also it was there that only those patients who have symptoms or sign of hypogonadism you should consider testing the testosterone it's not a routine test we see many of the patient getting this without any it's a routine thing it should not be done that is what the guideline says okay now in ada 2024 there was some changes for your uh, NASH, but the major changes that was in 2023, the ADA23 guidelines were completely revised for your fatty liver. Okay, that is very important. So, you should be screening. See, in previous guideline, what it was written that you should be screening for uh, these patients when they have increased your otpt but now they have changed see adults with type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes even with pre-diabetes particularly with obesity and cardiometabolic risk factor with or established acvd they should be screened for liver fibrosis using fib4 that is fibrosis 4 index and this has four components h otpt and platelet even if they have normal liver enzyme so this is a recent update that a normal liver enzyme should also be screened in previously it was written that when your enzymes are raised then you should be screening okay so this is a significant change and when you talk about the gastro people their guideline they already mentioned that in all the diabetics you should be doing the ada said that when the otpt is raised then you should be doing but this year they have again changed it that you should be doing it okay so you should screen this in the previous year it was written that patients with type 2 diabetes pre-diabetes elevated liver enzyme or fatty liver fatty liver on ultrasound should be evaluated for your liver fibrosis but now this has been changed then patient with diabetes and pre-diabetes with persistently elevated your otpt for more than six months with a low fibre score should be screened for other liver disease patients with type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes with intermediate or high fib4 they should have gone for a liver stiffness measurement that is fibro scan they should get it and then depending on that you should refer the patient or you should keep uh, for re-screening okay so this is your fib4 score and if that is less than 1.3 then it rules out fibrosis if it is more than 2.6 it predicts fibrosis and then you have something called as nfld fibrosis score but it's not mentioned in the guideline this is what is mentioned in the guideline regarding the fib4 score so fib4 score you have four component where you do age into ast divided by platelet count and uh, into under root of alt so obviously it's not manually possible there are now apps you just need to put the four values and it will give you a fib4 score less than 1.3 or more than 2.6 that is what you see now this is uh, this was updated in 2023 ada guideline the algorithm if you have a fib4 which is showing that uh, it's low risk you need to repeat in two to uh, two to three year intermediate and high risk you have to go for fibro scan low risk again repeat in two to three years high risk you should refer to a gastro that is what the algorithm says liver stiffness measurement that is less than 8 kilopascal this excludes that the patient have fibrosis more than 12 kilopascal suggests that the patient have advanced fibrosis and this should be referred to a gastro in 2024 they have also updated here that patients with type 2 diabetes with obesity or overweight with nfld should consider glp1 so this was a uh, newer addition here then pioglitazone this should be considered in biopsy proven NASH that is there in previous guideline also so this should be there and then insulin therapy is for decompensated cirrhosis for patients with decompensated cirrhosis insulin is the preferred agent for treatment of your diabetes so this remains the same the addition in this year was your GLP-1 now few terminologies this has been recently changed slightly so nfld everybody of us know that is non alcoholic fatty liver msld metabolic dysfunction associated steatotic 
liver disease this was a recent update then met ald that is metabolic dysfunction in alcoholic liver disease where the consumption of alcohol is beyond ingestion of more than 21 standard drinks per week in men and more than 14 standard drinks in women over a two year period of your uh, just before your evaluation okay so they have included like those patients who have type 2 diabetes also and those who were drinking significant amount that significant is this so in them you can combine these two diseases and can call as met ld metabolic dysfunction and alcoholic liver disease now coming to section 5 that is facilitating positive health behavior and well-being to improve health outcomes so these these most of the this exercise guideline remains the same so with type 1 or type 2 you have to ask your patient to have 150 minutes of exercise per week spread over three days with no more than two consecutive days without activity so this remains the same for type 1 type 2 and this has been there in previous guidelines also then with both type 1 type 2 you have to ask for 60 minutes per day of muscle strengthening and bone strengthening activities and then two to three sessions per week of resistance exercise on non-consecutive days and then very important flexibility training and balance training especially for your older patients because this will help them for fall prevention okay so that is recommended then in 2024 there was update about this nns non-nutritive sweetness because recently uh, there was something about aspartame by the fda so there is mentioning of the this uh, non-nutritive sweetness in ada 2024 so you see here like what we say to our patient that whenever they ask that can i drink this this or that all those things the best thing we say is you drink water right so that is what is mentioned counsel people with pre-diabetes or diabetes that water is recommended over nutritive and non-nutritive sweetened beverages so that is what we say in a, like a joke fashion that yes water is the best thing what you can drink right then non-nutritive sweetness as a replacement for your sugar sweetened products in moderation very important in moderation is acceptable okay but again the important is thing is that reduce overall calorie that is very important because see what happens then let's say patient is eating something uh, which is he's putting this sugar free all those things so he would be consuming more and then the overall calorie of that whole thing increases so that is important though you may have not taken a carb directly you have not added the sugar but overall the amount you have increased so the total calorie intake increases so that is very important so overall calorie is something which you should be focusing on okay so in july 14 2023 the fda has released regarding the aspartame possibly carcinogenic to human so this was in news all the newspaper this was there so fda has also mentioned what the upper limit the acceptable daily intake what is that so for your aspartame you have to uh, for upper limit it is close to 75 sachet which nobody is going to take in a day right so in moderation you can take it not a issue you can see here also aspartame the acceptable daily intake is 50 milligram per kg per day okay and then there are for others as well we are not going into detail this aspartame is something which you should be knowing and this is because this was there in the news also this can be a question in your exams also and this is a basic information you should be knowing now in ada 23 they have updated about your intermittent fasting time restricted fasting and calorie restriction so they've clearly mentioned whether you do anything it is almost same no significant difference in weight loss when compared with continuous calorie restriction for your time restricted or intermittent fasting so intermittent fasting all those things are included in intermittent fasting whether you talk about alternate day fasting where you restrict your energy by somewhere 500 to 600 calorie alternate days or 5 is to 2 where 5 days you take and 2 days you restrict 
or time restricted eating where you do not take something for up to 15 16 hours and you consume only within 8 or 9 hours that is what you do so everything whether you talk about intermittent fasting all those three or you talk about calorie restriction it is the same thing so most important is what total energy your patient is consuming in that day or in that week you can calculate something like that okay so and also for this update 2024 about the sleep promoting routines was mentioned that maintain a consistent sleep schedule that was mentioned in your ADA 2024. Now coming to section 6 that is glycemic target and hypoglycemia almost most of the things are same in this year also but few important changes like in previous year it was that your A1C and your CGM metrics you have to measure twice a year. Now they have uh, told here that excess uh, you have to take this information more often even every three months and this is for those individuals who are not meeting their treatment goals or who are having frequent or severe hypoglycemia, severe hyperglycemia or their health status is changing or during the youth at the growth and development phase. So in them you can be more aggressive in monitoring in assessing their glycemic status that is was a recent change in your 2024 otherwise the cutoff remains the same your hvnc less than seven percent your fasting and pre-meals somewhere 80 to 130 and your post prandial less than 180 all those things remain same uh, since many years okay now this uh, table was included in the recent uh, ada 2024 this part goal part was included otherwise the table remains the same that you have to work this cgm for 14 days for you collecting the data then at least 70 percent of the time uh, one should be there data should be collected over this 14 days then mean glucose is your simple you can see that average glucose over 14 days then your gmi that is glucose management indicator it is nothing but your estimated hbnc what was given previously the term was confusing about estimated hbnc some people used to consider as a1c so they have changed it to gmi that is glucose management indicator so it's a calculated a1c what you can say it may differ from your actually a1c then glycemic variability that is cv that should be less than 36 percent it's you can understand the troughs and the peaks of your blood sugar that's glycemic variability then your tir tar tbr that is time in range above range and below range so this is very important these are important concept and we have covered in a great detail in a cgm class i'm not going into too much details here it's a tape it's a complete two hour session in itself okay so tir depending on the age of the patient the cutoff differs and most of your non-pregnant adults with not so much comorbidities you would put your somewhere tir 70 to 180 with your time in range target of being more than 70 percent then your tar level one level two that there is and then your tbr that is time below range so this table was there in 23 also so slightly updated in 24 now you see here the ranges i have already told you more than 70 per, uh, 70 uh, percent is what you want your tir and your tbr level one less than four percent level two less than one percent that is less than 54 then this was added this was there in the graph also this was there in uh, your picture in previous guideline also but they mentioned in a point this year that for those with fragility or at risk of hypoglycemia a target of tir more than 50 percent and your tbr less than one percent that is what is recommended the same thing what you do for your hbnc when you have a patient who is elderly who is frail you don't want that patient to land up into hypoglycemia so what you do is you slightly relax your target okay because you don't want hypoglycemia same way for your tir tbr you want your tbr to be very low so you compromise on your tir and you allow slightly a higher tar that is time above range okay so that is there now you see here the time in range is 70 to 180 for most of your patient non-pregnant adults without much comorbidities and this should be more than 70 percent this is your tir and your tar that is level one that is more than 180 level two that is more than 250 so it should be less than five percent level two level one should be less than 25 percent and then tbr that should be less than four percent level one less than one percent level two that is less than 54 level 2 level 1 is less than 70 so all those things are mentioned here and i have told you everything now this is from attd type 1 type 2 we have already discussed everything older frail patient your tir timing range should be more than 
fifty percent is good enough, not less than. It is more than. So more than fifty percent is good enough. Your time above range up to fifty percent is also okay. But very important, your time below range should be less than one percent for old, frail, type one, type two diabetic patient. For pregnancy type one, we have data and. The timing range should be more than seventy percent, and very important. You see here the cutoffs. Cutoffs are different. The cutoffs are sixty-three to one forty. It's not seventy to one eighty. What you do for non-pregnant adults? The same way, what you do targets for your uh, blood sugars, right? One hour you want less than one forty. Two hours you want less than one twenty. That is why it is one forty as the cutoff in timing range, the upper limit. What you will keep here, and then for pregnant type two and GDM, you are. Time in range should be as high as possible because we don't have much data. So as far as you can go, that is what the recommendation say. Now in ADA twenty four, the uh, this there was also mention about it is beneficial for patient who are having high risk of hypoglycemia. So it is beneficial and recommended for individuals for hypoglycemia. So there was a great debate on that whether the patients with the CGM can pick up hypo because it was not mentioned for hypoglycemia, right? It was uh, for your timing range, all those things. At the lower level, it may not be so accurate. That that was the thought. But now the guidelines recently, twenty twenty four, clearly mentions that. Use of CGM is beneficial and recommended for individuals at high risk of hypoglycemia. Okay, now ADA guideline. This remains the same. That glucose less than seventy, you should be giving carbohydrate again after fifteen minutes. You have to repeat. So all those things remains the same. This is very important. That is why I have just put it. The same thing. Levels of hypoglycemia. Everything severe is level three, where the patient need assistance of someone. to help him right so that is level 3 level 1 is less than 70 level 2 is less than 54 so all those things remain same in ada since many years now what has been updated in 24 is this remains same that glucagon should be prescribed for all those patient who have uh, who are taking insulin or at risk of hypoglycemia and very important the family caregivers and school personals they should know how to administer it because see glucagon you are going to give when the patient will have severe hypoglycemia like the patient is unconscious so he will not be able to inject by himself so his caregiver should be knowing how to inject glucagon now a recent update in 2024 was regarding that You should be preferring glucagon preparation that do not require reconstitution. Okay, because what we used to do is that we have a pre-filled syringe, and then a ampule is there where you inject that uh, solvent, right? And then you reconstitute glucagon, and then you inject that glucagon to the patient, the whole one mg for the adult. That is what we used to do. Okay, now assessment of hypoglycemia risk among individual treated with insulin sulfonylurea. Yeah. So here this table was slightly updated here. So those patient who have recent hypoglycemia, those who are on insulin therapy, hypoglycemia unawareness, ESRD, cognitive impairment, multiple episode, basal insulin, age more than seventy five, female, high glycemic variability, polypharmacy, cardiovascular disease, CKD, neuropathy, retinopathy, major depressive disorder. So these are the patient who need assessment for the hypoglycemia. These are the patient who will have higher risk of hypoglycemia, right? Food insecurity, low income, homelessness, all those fasting, especially in India, this is really important. Then alcohol. so these are the patient whom you should see right then components of hypoglycemia prevention for individual at risk of hypoglycemia at initial follow up annual visits so what the guideline says that you should have hypoglycemia assessment every visit that we used to do right then hypoglycemia awareness unawareness that every visit you should see cognitive function at least annually then patient education especially if he is having recurrent hypoglycemia at every visit you should be doing consider cgm at every visit then deintensification simplification and agent modification as appropriate that is what you should be doing glucagon prescription at least annually you should be giving them and training the close contacts i have already mentioned and training for reestablishing your hypoglycemia awareness that should be done now coming to section 7 that is diabetes technology this is really important and this has been updated too much so i would ask you to 
प्लीज गो थ्रू एटलीस्ट दिस सेक्शन इन द रीसेंट गाइडलाइंस बिकॉज दिस हैज बीन चेंज टू मच एंड आई कैन नॉट कवर एवरीथिंग इन डिटेल सो आई जस्ट टेल यू व्हाट आर द इम्पॉर्टेंट थिंग्स सो इन दिस इन द अपडेट ट्वेंटी फोर अर्लियर ऑल्सो इट वॉज रिटर्न दैट यू हैव टू यूज सी जी एम इन टाइप वन डायबिटीज बट नाउ इट इज रिटर्न इवन एट डायग्नोसिस यू कैन यूज इट फॉर यूर सी जी एम फॉर यूर इंसुलिन पम्प एंड द क्लोज लूप इंसुलिन पम्प इज चेंज विथ ए आई डी सो द टर्मोलॉजी हैज बीन चेंज एंड इवन एट द डायग्नोसिस यू कैन ऑफर टू यूर टाइप वन डायबिटिक पेशेंट्स इन ट्वेंटी थ्री देर वॉज अ अपडेट ऑन द interfering substances for your cgm okay there was for your glucometer but in 23 they have also mentioned about your cgm device uh, interfering substances so it has been almost same your paracetamol alcohol ascorbic acid hydroxyurea mannitol and tetracycline so this was from your 2023 ada guideline your tetracycline has been removed from the recent guideline and they have added a sorbitol and they have removed alcohol so there are data for everything but yes these are some important thing paracetamol ascorbic acid hydroxyurea mannitol sorbitol so with which system they interfere that you should be knowing in india most of us are using actually freestyle libre only so this is very important you should be knowing that ascorbic acid vitamin c more than 500 mg per day your sensor readings will be higher than what actually the sugar of your patients are so this is very important and then we are also using dexcom we are also using guardian but most of us are actually using this freestyle libre so you should be knowing this okay the same thing is mentioned here also you should also be knowing about the interfering substances with the glucometer so your glucometer basically works on two principle either a glucose oxidase monitor or a glucose dehydrogenase monitor so here this glucose oxidase monitors these are the uh, monitors which we usually use in our clinical practice so uric acid galactose xylose acetaminophen and l-dopa these things will interfere with the reading of your oxidase based glucometers for the dehydrogenase monitors which are less likely used in indian uh, this settings so here icodextrin is something which you should be knowing that this will interfere with the reading of your these glucometers now for the ada guideline this this was there in previous also that your real time cgm or intermittently scanned cgm should be used in those patient who are on multiple daily insulin injections insulin pumps and this should also be offered to those patients who are on basal therapy so this remains the same i am not reading the whole thing then those patient who are using your intermittently scan cgm they should be using scanning this at least 8 hours so that is what is available in india we don't use much of the real time cgm because of the cost in india we have this libre the basic one we don't have 2 and 3 and this intermittently scan the libre freestyle that needs to be the reader needs to be brought to the sensor near the sensor every 8 hours otherwise your data will be missed the memory for your reader is somewhere around 90 days and your the sensor will store data only for 8 hours so the last data keeps on removing deleting right so that every 8 hours you have to bring that reader near to your sensor okay that is important and then when used as an adjunct to preprandial and postprandial blood glucose monitoring cgm can help to achieve hb1c in patients with diabetes and pregnancy so in pregnancy you can use along with your blood sugar monitoring that is what your guideline says now here there was a update in 2024 ada dexcom g6 was there with uh, your aid systems but now dexcom g7 is there and recently libre 2 libre 3 of your abort free cell which are still not available in india they are also fda approved for your aid devices okay then dexcom g6 is now integrated with all the aid system t slim then your omnipod ilet and mobi okay guardian 3 is available 
and this is integrated with your AID 780G which is now available in India and now even Guardian 4 is available in India and it is also approved to be used with your 780G. So this are recent update of 2024 that basic difference between these 3 and 4 Guardian is basically see Guardian 3 needs calibration the patient needs to prick twice daily and calibrate the sensor with his blood glucose whereas this guardian 4 do not require this calibration it's factory calibrated okay your freestyle libre do not require any calibration okay then recently cgm indication has been expanded to include the pregnancy and that is for your dexcom g7 freestyle libre 2 and libre 3 and we have already seen the tir for pregnancy is 63 to 140 and you have to keep it more than 70 percent in type 1 type 2 you have to keep it as high as possible the important thing is the ranges that differs from your non-pregnant adult where you keep it 70 to 180 here you keep it 62 63 to 140 okay so this is a recent update from ada 2024 okay now there was also update regarding the patients who are hospitalized so in people with diabetes using personal cgm so there are two types of cgm personal cgm and professional cgm professional cgm is basically blinded and your personal cgm are two type whether intermittently scanned or real-time cgm so this is about personal cgm the use of this cgm should be continued when clinically appropriate during hospitalization with confirmatory point of care glucose measurement for insulin dosing and hypoglycemia so this is important that you can use in hospitalized patient but they also need a blood sugar by the glucometer for dosing of insulin so this is from your ada 2024 regarding hospitalized patients and in them when where we can use cgm or not so this was recent update in 2024 now coming to section 8 that is obesity and weight management for prevention and treatment of type 2 diabetes so there are number of changes in this section see here firstly this was from previous itself that you should not be telling that obese person you should be speaking person with obesity so there's slight difference in that where in our region what we say is aap mote nahi hai, aapko motapa hai. that means this is a disease which you can remove from yourself when you talk about obese person you are labeling that patient right so this is a difference that you should be using a non-judgmental language use a person centered language okay this will gain more confidence of your patient that he would be treated okay so this is important now we don't say diabetic person we say person with diabetes so these are mentioned in guidelines guidelines also coming to ada 2024 we used to uh, calculate the BMI to label the patient as obese or non-obese, right? They have also mentioned this year that perform additional measurements of body fat distribution like your waist circumference, waist to hip ratio and waist to height ratio. So this is a recent update in ADA 2024. Also, they have mentioned that people with type 2 diabetes who are obese or uh, overweight, these patients should have primary goal of weight management along with their glycemic management so weight management is given a very much importance in this guideline this is important to know okay in ada 2023 it was mentioned that a weight loss in those patients who are diabetic along with overweight or obesity weight loss is recommended and 3 to 7 percent of the weight loss will help them to improve the glycemia and cardiovascular risk factor and even more weight loss that is more than 10 percent will give them additional benefit and possible remission of type 2 and long-term cardiovascular outcomes and mortality may improve okay so this is for your patients with diabetes and then you have to individualize the treatment lifestyle is obviously recommended pharmacologic agents and metabolic surgery now this table has been removed from your ada 2024 but the they have mentioned almost the same thing that beyond 23 i'm talking about indians here you have to advise for nutrition that is all those lsm thing and then pharmacotherapy beyond 25 
and metabolic surgery beyond 27.5 BMI. Okay, but this table was removed, but the text was retained and things were slightly deferred. So here in 2024, they have also mentioned that those patients with diabetes, with overweight or obesity, they should, be, the drug preferred should be a GLP-1 or dual agonist GIP-GLP, that is trisipatide. This was mentioned in the 2023 also, but they have slightly incorporated, uh, slightly given more importance in the ADA 24 guidelines. Okay. So, this should be considered for their weight independent benefits also. You see here, in the last year, this was their 2023, which has been removed that those patients who do not have when the early response is insufficient with this weight loss therapy that is less than 5% consider discontinuation of the medication that is what was mentioned in ADA 23 but this has been removed in 24 okay if more than 20 uh, more than 5% weight loss was there you should be continuing that is obviously there but less than 5% now it was written here insufficient now they have changed it to modest so, when the early weight loss results are modest, that is less than 5% with three, uh, 3 months of therapy, the benefits of the treatment should be balanced in the context of glycemic response and the availability of other potential treatment options, treatment tolerance and overall treatment burden. So, they do not say that now you discontinue, you should see individualized treatment and you may continue because of your glycemic response as well. Okay, so this is very important. This was recent change in ADA 2024. Now here again in ADA 2024, they have slightly relaxed, I would say slightly, they are more aggressive now. So, Consider metabolic surgery as a weight and glycemic management approach in people with diabetes with BMI of more than 30 in, in uh, this is from Western and in Indian it would be more than 27.5. So initially it was when you have used other non-surgical treatment but now they have removed that line. Okay, when the patient is a good surgical candidate and the BMI is more than 27.5, you should consider metabolic surgery. That means they are going more aggressive in this guideline 2024. And this was your previous guideline where they have written that more than 40, you should consider, you should recommend this metabolic surgery. And then more than 35 who do not achieve the weight loss with non-surgical method then you should recommend and again for more than 30 when the not surgical method have failed you should recommend so that was you should consider that is what was written and here it was recommend and now here it is written consider with more than 27.5 who are good for surgical going for surgical candidates like they you can go for surgery you should be advising them for metabolic surgery okay now in ada 24 they have also mentioned that patient who have already undergone the metabolic surgery they should be assessed for weight recurrence every 6 to 12 months so this was a recent update in ada 2024 now coming to section 9 pharmacological approach to glycemic treatment this is the most important section i would say for all the clinicians who are listening to this talk this is the most important section obviously this is what you should prescribe when you should prescribe to whom you should prescribe so, in update ADA 2024, there was mentioned for this that in type 1 patients, insulin analogs, obviously it was there that insulin analogs you should prefer because of uh, reduced hypoglycemia risk. Also, they have mentioned here about inhaled insulin in 2024. Then they have mentioned in 2024 guideline about the CGM for type 1 that you can give them and you should advise them early use of CGM is recommended with type 1 diabetes to improve the glycemic outcome and quality of life and minimize your hypoglycemia. AID should be considered for all patients right from the beginning of your type 1 diagnosis. Glucagon should be prescribed, everything I mentioned and the recent updates was that glucagon preparation that do not require reconstitution should be preferred. Then in ADA 2023, there they have mentioned regarding the weight management is an 
impactful component of glucose lowering management of type 2 diabetes this thing they have retained in 2024 then in 2023 they have mentioned that early combination therapy can be considered in some patient at treatment initiation to extend the time to treatment failure so there was written that it can be considered here they have written that early combination can be considered in adults with type 2 diabetes at treatment initiation to shorten the time to attain of individualized treatment goal so there was slight change in the guideline here then they have also mentioned regarding the SGLT2 inhibitor that those patients with type 2 who have heart failure either reduced or preserved ejection fraction. So, so this preserved ejection fraction was updated in recent guideline. Then this cutoff was changed in last year that SGLT2 inhibitor you can prescribe to those patients who have EGF of or EGF of or more than 20. Okay. So in adults with type 2 diabetes who have CKD, you have to prescribe this SGLT2 inhibitor to minimize the progression of CKD for reduction of cardiovascular event for reduction of hospitalization to heart failure. And this less than 45 EGFR, the glycemic benefit of the SGLT2 inhibitor are reduced. So this was same. The cutoff was changed in 2023. Then in advanced CKD with EGF of, EGFR less than 30, a GLP-1 receptor agonist is preferred because it has lower risk of hypoglycemia and it has cardiovascular benefits. In ADA 2024, there was update that initiation of insulin for type 2 diabetic should be considered regardless of the background glucose lowering therapy this was added in the recent guideline in those patients who have features of catabolism like unexpected weight loss if they have symptoms of hyperglycemia and when the hbnc is more than 10 or if the blood glucose is more than 300 so the cutoff remains the same only they have added regardless of the background glucose lowering therapy or disease stage this was updated in ada 2024 also they have updated for this that in type 2 diabetic patient glp1 ra is preferred over insulin now they have added with glp1 ra they have recently updated this that dual agonist gip glp that is trizepatide that they have included that this should be preferred over insulin in type 2 diabetic patients also, they have updated here in 2024 that the glucose lowering agent may be continued upon initiation of insulin. This was recent update unless it is contraindicated for ongoing glycemic and metabolic benefits. So now we have those therapy SGLT2 and GLP. They have this cardiometabolic renal benefit. So that should be continued. So this was a recent update in 2024 ADA. Now you see here the flow chart I have put for all the 3-4 years. This is very important so that you understand how the guidelines and have evolved and what has been changed. So let us talk about ADA 2021. So here it was written that the first line therapy is metformin. Okay. Then you should assess for ASCVD, established ASCVD, risk factor for ASCVD, CKD and heart failure. So, this was the first time when this ASCVD was put in the guideline in 2021. And then accordingly with the established proven CVD benefit, GLP-1 or an SGLT-2 should be preferred in those patients who have risk factor or who have established ASCVD. And those patients who have heart failure with particularly reduced ejection fraction. So, this was in 2021. Now, they have incorporated with preserved ejection fraction also. So, in them, you should prefer an SGLT2 inhibitor and those patients who have DKD or those who have microalbuminuria, there you should prefer a SGLT2 inhibitor. This was in 2021 ADA and then if the patient do not have this ASCVD, CKD, heart failure, then depending if the cost is the major issue, sulfonylurea and pioglitazone. If weight gain is the major issue, your patient is obese, you don't want weight gain, then GLP-1 
or SGLT2 here it was or any of you can uh, initiate in the next year guideline they have preferred GLP1 over SGLT2 inhibitor I am coming to that and if the risk of hypoglycemia that is what you were fearing then a DPP4 GLP1 SGLT2 or pioglitazone that is what you would prefer so this was your ADA 2021 guideline now you see here in 2022 guideline here see first it was written metformin and then they have mentioned about lifestyle in ADA 2022 the first First line that they have written that consider all those lifestyle modification and metformin that was written here then ACVD all those things were there GLP-1 SGLT-2 in those patients that was there but here they have changed here to if there is heart failure SGLT-2 inhibitor that means both heart failure with preserved and reduced that was mentioned here then in CKD again the, all those things were same here they have also mentioned about the cost and all those things where they are minimize hypoglycemia but what has been changed is this part that if you want to minimize the weight gain then a GLP-1 receptor agonist that should be preferred uh, against your SGLT2 inhibitor so that was updated in your ADA 22 rest remains the same now in ADA 23 they have completely changed this algorithm see here LSM is first thing you will advise then not metformin metformin they have put it lower down now they have mentioned that cardio renal risk reduction those patients who have established ASCVD heart failure uh, this microalbumin urea CKD all those these this was the thing they have preferred right and then again that GLP-1 or SGLT-2 heart failure they have mentioned that an SGLT2 would be preferred again the CKD same thing should be there and again here the cutoff was changed if you can see here the cutoff for your EGFR that you can use that was decreased here I think it's not much visible but you can see the 20 so it was mentioned 20 in 2023 guideline that was a recent change from the AMPA trial right so MPA kidney they have used here 20 and then here you can see that metformin they have put it lower down here so you can use here and then they have also changed depending on the efficacy of weight loss and on the efficacy of glucose lowering ability so this was a recent change in 2023 the guidelines were completely changed efficacy for glucose lowering very high for dulaglutide semaglutide tisiptide and insulin and high for your glp1 which are not listed above metformin sglt2 inhibitor sulfonylurea thiazolindone and intermediate for dpp4 inhibitor and efficacy for weight loss very high for semaglutide and tisiptide high for dulaglutide liraglutide okay and very important they have put metformin as weight neutral drug okay so this was ADA 2023 now this is ADA 2024 which is almost similar to 2023 not much changed so the 23 was somewhere where the algorithm was completely changed okay now coming to section 10 that is cardiovascular disease and risk management few things have been changed here but uh, very important updates were in 2023 so hypertension that was the definition was changed in ADA 2023. So hypertension was defined as systolic more than 130 and diastolic more than 80 with more than two measurement obtained on more than two occasions. So this definition they have retained in 2024. The previous guideline, the 2022 guideline have mentioned the cutoff as 140 by 90 and even a single reading of blood pressure more than 180 by 110 qualifies the patient for having hypertension. Okay, so this you can diagnose on a single and the cutoff have been changed to 130 by 80 more than that you will call as hypertension this was updated in 2023 and this is retained in 2024 now the treatment see in ada 2022 because the guidelines were saying that it was more than 140 by 90 so the treatment pharmacological therapy that was advised beyond 140 by 90 only but the lifestyle modification was advised beyond 120 by 80 the same 120 by 80 lifestyle modification in 23 24 also but the pharmacotherapy is advised beyond 130 by 80 in both the ada 23 and 24 so this is important the cutoff when you should be treating your patient for hypertension that is more than 130 by 80 okay now what are the targets the targets are less than 130 by 80 in previous guideline ada 2022 if the patient have high cv risk factor it was one 
30 by 80 but if the risk factors was less the target was 140 by 90 so that was the definition there and that was the target there okay now the definition and the target they have slightly stricken okay they they've been more aggressive in the recent guidelines okay now this is the algorithm from ada 2022 i'll just briefly go through the three years that what has been changed so you see here the initial bp more than 140 by 90 then you have to start with one agent maybe it's not much visible here you can see now so 140 by 90 you have to start and if the bp is more than 160 by 100 you have to start with two agents okay and if the patient have albuminuria or coronary artery disease you have to use ace or arb and that is what is our first preferred choice we obviously do in most of the patient we give this only so if bp is more than 160 by 100 you have to initiate with dual drugs okay this is your ada 2022 in ada 2023 they have changed the bp cutoff you have to start treatment with more than 130 by 90 and if the bp is more than 160 by 100 you have to give two drugs the same guidelines which were there in previous 2022 and then again all those things cad albumin urea one drug if not then add another all those things remains the same now in ada 2024 again they have brought changes the initial treatment remain same that is 130 by 90 if that is there you have to treat the patient with your drugs but if the initial bp is more than 150 by 90 from 160 by 100 they have reduced it to 150 by 90 if that is there then you have to start two agents and lifestyle modification obviously beyond 120 by 80 you have to advise so this is more aggressive over the years 22 from 23 now in 24 the two drugs you should initiate beyond 150 by 90 that is what is your recent update in 2024 and then they have also updated in 2024 that ace arb or mra wherever you are giving that then potassium should be measured that was written in previous guideline also but now they have mentioned that within 7 to 14 days of initiation of therapy you should be monitoring potassium so this is a recent update that one to two week after you start this therapy you have to monitor the potassium in this patient and then at least annually you should monitor potassium and your creatinine you have to monitor in this patient whom you initiate this therapy now in 2023 for the primary prevention they have changed the cutoffs here you can see for people with diabetes with 40 to 75 years who have high risk of cardiovascular disease or this is about primary prevention that means they have not established ACVD. okay you should recommend high intensity statin to reduce the LDL to more than 50% from the baseline and the LDL targets were mentioned as less than 70. So this was updated in 2023 guideline. 2024 also mentioned the same LDL cutoff of less than 70. This is for primary prevention, those who have not established ASCVD. Okay. And then you can add, it is reasonable to add acetamide or a PCSK9 inhibitor if maximum tolerated dose of statin has been used to achieve that target. Then also those patients who are more than 75 years statin therapy is reasonable to continue and if more than 75 you have to discuss for initiation if already on therapy you have to continue that is what was updated in 2023 for primary prevention I am talking about for secondary prevention obviously you will give for primary prevention I am talking about here now in ADA 2024 they have updated here you can see about the bempedoic acid in people with diabetes intolerant to statin treatment with bempedoic acid is recommended to reduce the cardiovascular event rates as an alternate to your therapy right so this is important bempedoic acid that is introduced in your ADA 2024 now this is about your high intensity uh, therapy many of us think that it is atorva 20 no atorva statin 40 to 80 is considered as high intensity whereas up to 20 it is considered as moderate intensity statin that is why i put this chart and rosuva statin 20 to 40 is considered as high intensity statin now for secondary prevention they have mentioned about some few more things here for people with diabetes and established ASCVD who are intolerant to your statin pcsk9 inhibitor bempedoic acid and then incliseran 
this has been introduced in the recent guideline 2024 in uh, 2023 they have mentioned this is for again secondary prevention diabetes with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease established disease okay you have to treat with high intensity uh, statin that is recommended the ldl level that was mentioned that the target should be less than 55 so this was a update in 2023 they have retained in 2024 ada guideline says that this is since many years that obtain a lipid profile after initiation of your lipid lowering therapy at one to three months after initiation of a change in dose and then annually this is recommended by your ada and statins are absolutely contraindicated in patients with pregnancy for triglyceride more than 500 you have to evaluate for secondary cause because they this increases the risk of pancreatitis for patients having triglyceride between 175 to 500, you have to have lifestyle modification and then you have to correct the secondary factors, diabetes, chronic liver disease, chronic kidney disease, nephrotic syndrome, hypothyroidism. So you have to address all those things. Very, very important. This has been there in guidelines since many years. Statin plus fibroid combination is not been shown to improve a cvd outcome and is generally not recommended so please do not prescribe each and every patient you are prescribing this statin along with fibroid rosuva plus uh, all those rosuva statin plus phenofibroid atorva statin plus phenofibroid so that's not recommended by the guidelines in ada 2024 there was a mention about your bnp pro bnp level okay so this has been a recent update in your 2024 adults with diabetes at increased risk of development of asymptomatic cardiac structural or functional abnormality or symptomatic heart failure, consider screening adults with diabetes by measuring a BNP or pro-BNP to facilitate prevention of stage C heart failure. So this was a recent update for measuring BNP or pro-BNP and terminal pro-BNP. Okay, so this was a recent update. Asymptomatic individual with diabetes and abnormal BNP level echocardiography is recommended then in ada 2024 also they have uh, told about peripheral arterial disease so diabetes asymptomatic age more than 50 years microvascular disease at any location or foot complication or any end organ damage screening for peripheral arterial disease with abi is recommended okay an individual with diabetes more than 10 years screening for PAD is recommended. So this PAD screening was updated in the 2024. Also two pressures were updated here. Then in 2023, Finrenon was mentioned. I'm not going again into all those trials. We have covered in our last session about the Fidelio Figaro, all those trials. I'm not going again detail, but those patients with diabetes, with CKD, with albuminuria, with maximum tolerated dose of ASA, ARB should be given Finrenon. So this is after your AS and ARB, okay, to reduce the progression of CKD. So this was mentioned in 2023, first time Finrenon was added there. Bempedoic acid is recently added in 2024. In 2024, also they have updated about the patient who are type 1 or type 2 who are ketosis prone, consuming ketogenic dry or SGLT2 inhibitor should be educated about ketoacidosis, about the management and about the measurement that is serum beta hydroxybutyrate. So this was a recent update in 2024. Now coming to section 11, that is CKD and risk management. In previous guideline, actually neuropathy, nephropathy, retinopathy were clubbed together. Now we have this nephropathy is a complete different section since last two, three years. So in 2023, the cutoffs were updated for patient with type two diabetes, SGLT2 inhibitor is reduced to, is recommended to reduce CKD progression and cardiovascular events with an EGFR of more than 20. This was updated in 2023. So we have data for ampaglyphosin that can be used beyond 20 and for dapaglyphosin that can be used beyond 25, about 25. Okay. And then USCR more than 200. So you should give this patient the benefit of SGLT2 inhibitor. Previously, it was 25, which was reduced to 20 in 2023 ADA guidelines. 
in 2024 guidelines they have changed this initially they have mentioned that non dialysis dependent ckd stage g3 they should have restricted protein intake that is 0.8 gram per kg per day and those patients who are on dialysis the recommendation this has been recently added in ada 2024 that is 1 to 1.2 gram per kg per day of protein intake should be prescribed to those ckd patient who are on dialysis so this number has been updated in 2024 guidelines now this uh, this heat map is recently slightly changed the cutoffs remain same a2 a3 a2 a1 a3 all those remain same all this g1 to g5 all those remain same the egfr cutoff remains same the protein urea cutoff remains same the things that has been changed is the color of heat map and the risk and the number of times you need to assess for ckd progression so if you see here if the patient have protein urea more than more than 300 milligram per gram of creatinine you should assess three times in a year so all those things have been changed so you can just go through this chart pause the video and go through this chart it is useless to tell everything here okay so please remember this chart heat map this is really important that ckd progression depends and another very important thing you should see here that even with a low egfr with less of protein urea is a better candidate than a patient who have better egfr with more protein urea you can see here this is more uh, worse than this patient where the egfr of let's say 35 whereas here egfr of let's say 55 with a higher protein urea so you have to assess this heat map right that is important now this has been recently updated so for those patients who have diabetes and ckd you have to manage three things firstly the bp the lipids and the sugar so for type 1 obviously the sugar management is insulin for type 2 you have to prescribe an sglt2 inhibitor with egfr of more than 20 and metformin if the egfr is more than 30 and then you may prescribe a glp1 if required to achieve the glycemic target right for bp obviously ras inhibitor that is ace arb that is what we give right and for type 2 if the patient have protein urea still then you have to prescribe finrenone that is non-steroidal mrna which are not approved for type 1 this is for type 2 then for both type 1 type 2 if the bp is not controlled you have to prescribe diuretic ccb all those things right then for lipids you have to give moderate to high intensity statin and then antiplatelet and azetimai pcsk9 icosapent ethyl all those if recommended so this should be there so three things you have to manage bp sugar and lipids for both type 1 type 2 ckd now coming to section 12 that is retinopathy neuropathy and foot care this has been updated too much in 2023 not much in 2024 very few changes so we know that for uh, retinopathy we need to get the fundus for type 1 diabetes within five years of diagnosis you need it for type 2 at the diagnosis you need it nothing has been changed then if that is normal annual or one to two year screening is good enough that is what is recommended that remains the same then for retinal photography with remote reading the recent changes is that the algorithm should be us fda approved artificial intelligence algorithm can be used so this is a recent update in ada 2024 then those patients who are planning for pregnancy you should counsel for risk of progression of diabetic retinopathy and then you should get a fundus before pregnancy then in first trimester then in every trimester then one year postpartum that is what the recommendation says because pregnancy increases the risk of retinopathy it increases the progression then in 2022 ada they have also recommended this anti-VEGF for patients with PDR okay otherwise it was only the lesser 
photo calculation that was approved okay this was in ada 2022 then if the patient have retinopathy this is not a contraindication for aspirin this is very important and this does not increase risk of retinal hemorrhage so this is from previous guideline so this you should be knowing that aspirin can be given in this patient and ideally it should be given that's an indication for most of our patients then in 2023 there was too many changes for neuropathy you see here gabapentinoids that is your pregabalin gabapentin snri tca sodium channel blockers are recommended as initial therapy okay for neuropathic pain painful diabetic neuropathy so these were recommended that is an update of 2023 important is word recommended here now you see here snri duloxetine venlafaxine and desvenlafaxine these are recommended and this can be given in patient for painful diabetic neuropathy and the previous guideline says that venlafaxine tca carbamazepine and topical capsaicin this is not approved and this year they have wrote that it is recommended okay so this was the change in 2023 which was all these things were removed scratched off from the 2022 guidelines then tca that was not approved in previously see here not approved that was here it can be given that was the ada 2023 and this was for amitriptyline this was ada 2024 and the same has been written in 2024 23 and 24 then capsaicin this is also approved for treatment this is again in 2023 and 24 topical this can be given especially for those patients who have contraindication to oral pharmacotherapy then in ada 2023 there was update for the sodium channel blocker lamotrigine oxcarbamazepine velproate Lecosamide, but carbamazepine was not there in 24 ADA 2024. They have also included carbamazepine. So you can give them for painful diabetic neuropathy. See here, carbamazepine was scratched off in the 2024 guideline. Alpha lipoic acid, although not approved, it can be given and it may be effective. So this carbamazepine was scratched off and this was recommended in 2024 guideline. In 2022, they, these were not approved. TCA, venlafaxine, carbamazepine, topical, capsaicin, all this was not approved, but these are now approved in 2024 ADA. Then what is a recent update in ADA 2024 is lidocaine 5% patch. This have limited data and it may be used in these patients who are having painful diabetic neuropathy. So this was there in the recent ADA 2024. Then in 2023, there was update for the peripheral arterial disease, which was not there in 2022. So you have to assess the lower extremity pulses that was there in previous also. Capillary refill time, this was recently updated. Rubber on dependency, pallor on elevation and venous feeling time. So you should evaluate this for peripheral arterial disease. What has been updated is that you should also see for toe pressure. Then you should have history for leg fatigue, claudication, rest pain, all those things, ABI. And then this TBI is something which has recently updated in 2024. The TBI was not there in 2023. So this is a recent update for peripheral arterial disease. Now coming to section 13 that is older adults. So only few changes I would in fact these guidelines are same from the previous. So for those patients who are otherwise healthy you should target a lower HBNC that is less than 77.5. Those who have some complex health issues you can slightly relax the target that is less than 8% that is from the previous guideline itself nothing much to say here. Coming to section 
14 that is children and adolescents again most of the guidelines are same that for type 1 diabetes you should screen for autoimmune con uh, condition you should get an anti tpo you can get an anti thyroglobulin antibody soon after the diagnosis then you have to get a tsh and if that is normal every one to two years you can get it okay so these remains the same from the previous year then for the celiac disease you have to screen within two years of the diagnosis of diabetes and then again after five years okay so this remains the same then for the lipid profile for the adolescents for here you can see that you have to screen from the age of more than two years and if that is normal you can again screen at 9 to 11 years that is what is recommended okay non-fasting will also do here then if that is normal again after every three years you have to screen in this patient this is for type 1 i am talking about then after the age of 10 years you can prescribe statin to type 1 diabetes who have the hbn uh, this ldl more than 160 despite having a good lsm lifestyle changes okay so you can prescribe them then in 2024 few changes were there that if the glycemic goals are no longer met with metformin glp1 empagliflozin can be considered in children with uh, about 10 years of age and obviously this is for type 2 diabetes not for type 1 so this is important that recently empagliflozin is approved so this is a recent update that has been included in 2024 for type 2 diabetes more than 10 years of age if after metformin the sugars are not controlled you can give them this okay for youth not meeting the glycemic control maximize the non-insulin therapy that is again metformin glp1 and empagliflozin so this has been recently approved if still the blood sugars are not controlled you have to add insulin the other drugs are not approved you cannot give them dpp4 inhibitors coming to section 15 that is management of diabetes in pregnancy so again most of the guidelines remain same that you have to do a preconceptional counseling and this should begin right at the puberty this you should include and ideally the preconceptional your hb1c should be less than 6.5 percent that is again very important to know and then those patients who have pre-existing type 1 type 2 diabetes if they become pregnant then diabetic retinopathy is something you should be looking for you should screen ideally get a fundus before pregnancy first trimester then every trimester then a one year postpartum all those things remains same then an update of ada 2024 is that the targets remains the same that your fasting should be less than 95 your one hour should be less than 140 two hours should be less than 120 these are important the pregnancy cutoff and the non-pregnancy cutoff of diabetes are different please remember them that in pregnancy you want a stricter control so your Fasting should be less than 95, your 1 hour should be less than 140, 2 hours should be less than 120. So these are important. But what has changed in recent ADA 2024 is that initially it was written in the last guidelines, some individual with pre-existing diabetes should also check their sugars preprandially. But now the guideline recommended fasting preprandial. Preprandial has been added. Fasting preprandial and postprandial blood sugar are recommended in patients with diabetes with pregnancy. Okay, so these are important. The cutoffs, what you should target, is really important. So preprandial is included now in the recent ADA 2024. Then what are the targets in pregnancy for the blood sugar i've already told you for a1c it is less than six percent if you can get it without hypoglycemia it is good but if your patient is having too many hypos you can slightly relax the target to less than seven percent that is what the guideline says again the same from previous year now the ada 2024 has also updated regarding the cgm is recommended in pregnancy with type 1 we have data i've already told you the cutoffs the tir everything and then the hypoglycemia targets remains the same less than 70 but for the sensor it should be less than 63 that has been recently added breastfeeding is recommended to reduce the risk of maternal type 2 diabetes and should be considered that remains the same in the as the previous year okay so this was updated in 2023 this remains the same in 24 
and then this breastfeeding confers long term metabolic benefits and there is some data and then breastfeeding reduces the risk of developing of type 2 diabetes in patients with previous GDM all those things have been mentioned in 2023 that uh, these all these things are retained in 2024 this was not in 2022 okay so these were updates for ADA 2023 now coming to the section 16 that is diabetes care in hospital okay now here you see they have added a word and other therapies it was only in insulin so insulin or other therapies should be initiated or intensified for treatment of persistent hyperglycemia beyond 180 milligram per dl for non-critically ill individual this is again important so two words to emphasize here one is non-critically ill the other one is that yes you can give something other than insulin so insulin and or other therapies in non-critically ill that is non-icu patient you have to give the cutoff remains the same that is 180 then more stringent goal 110 to 140 should be targeted if acceptable without hypoglycemia then in 2023 they have also mentioned 100 to 180 which they have removed in 2024 ada guidelines so the recent update mentioned only 110 to 140 they have deleted this 100 to 180 that this you can go more stringent so 100 they have not mentioned so this was a recent update of ada 2024 then in ada 2024 they have also mentioned regarding your personal cgm that yes you can use them during hospitalization i have already told you but you also need point of care glucose monitoring that is glucometer that you knew it for insulin dosing hypoglycemia assessment all those things i have already mentioned in my previous slides okay then also the recent update for ada 2024 is regarding your insulin pump aid so yes you can use them in the hospitalized patient should be continued during hospitalization if clinically appropriate with confirmatory point of care blood glucose monitoring so the same thing as you want like for cgm you can use and also you can use your insulin pump so this is a recent update of 2024 this was not mentioned there in 2023 then again this is the same previous years guideline that basal insulin or basal plus bolus you should be using in non-critically ill hospitalized patient who are not taking much by mouth the same thing very important again we are saying that please do not use sliding scale this is obsolete this should be discouraged the same old guidelines are here in 2024 please do not use sliding scale okay then in ada 2024 they have also used this see type 2 diabetes hospitalized with heart failure it is recommended to use the sglt2 it should be initiated and continued during hospitalization and upon discharge until there is some contraindication so this is a recent update of 2024 heart failure you have to use during admission also so this was updated in ada 2024 so with this we end the session i hope this was useful i have tried to cover as much as possible obviously the guideline is tremendously large i cannot tell you each and everything i cannot tell you all the data i cannot back up all this statement for that you need to go to the guidelines you have to see but i hope the session was useful i have given a complete detail that what are the changes how the guidelines have evolved over years and what are important things we should focus while treating our patients with diabetes both type 1 and type 2 thank you very much